Hello, this is Harvey Ambrose, and I am preaching this message on behalf of the Missionary Baptist Voice of Africa radio program and station located in Monrovia, Liberia, uh, to wherever this broadcast reaches, and if it's posted on YouTube, to all of you out there that, that view this online. I do want to begin uh, by an apology to my listeners there uh, in Liberia. The, uh, the circumstances of my life recently in which I've been preaching back-to-back -back revivals in the state of Kentucky where we are now located and also in South Arkansas have required uh, my presence uh, there and, and my study and the thoughts on my heart uh, to be towards those works which required me to be there preaching. And, uh, and I've asked the radio station to just play former recordings uh, of mine to you there. Normally, you guys are amongst the top people on my heart. And yet, lately, it's been with this. So I apologize for not, uh, not well, these past three Sunday or Saturdays, not, uh, not recording a message for you to hear on Sunday night. And I also want to apologize just because, you know, I've noticed a, uh, a decrease in the letters and questions that are sent to me. Uh, the, at least to me, it indicates probably a lack of, uh, a lack of interest on your part, which as I review it is most likely because of what I'm preaching lately. I've been preaching through or trying to the book of Genesis. Now, I may have been mistaken uh, when I thought that the Lord uh, burdened my heart to teach you these things. I may not have been mistaken. I don't know. I can't answer that. I do know that a fundamental understanding of the facts, the historical facts, uh, along with the... the uh, for lack of a better term, the spiritual significance of those facts is important for every person on this planted planet. When, when Jesus, in his personal ministry on earth, uh, met with people and preached to them and helped them so that they could be saved, when he spoke, he explained himself very often in terms of, of, uh, of, of, these, of these very events uh, revealed to us in the book of Genesis. He talks about Abraham. He talks about Moses. Of course, that's Exodus. But he talks about, uh, you know, Adam and Eve. He talks about the creation. He, he talks about all the things that really we only learn if we read and study uh, the historical account provided to us by God in the book of Genesis. And I feel, and I felt at the time, that if I could help you to understand Genesis, at least at the historical narrative level, that then when I'm preaching other things, say from the New Testament, more directed towards uh, helping you, turning you from darkness unto light, turning you towards the Lord who could uh, bring light to your heart in the form of everlasting life, being born again. I would not have to continuously repeat or try to explain the references that are there to these things which are laid out in Genesis. Now, I may have confused the issue more just by that explanation, but I guess I yet feel that feel that, that I should try to uh, continue this. I don't know if it's preaching or if it's just like a, a very long Sunday school in which I go from chapter to chapter and verse to verse explaining the events in Genesis. But if you bear with me through that, you will have what the Lord has given us concerning the beginning of all things created, which includes us to this very day. 
and, and the end eventually of, of all those things and, and our part in it which we see in, in the lives of the people and their events as depicted in Genesis so that they become like a picture or a shadow of, of ourselves in the future, see? And in other words, in the future, as far as Abraham saw it, people are now benefiting by understanding what happened in the life of Abraham and of his wife, Sarah, and of his son, Isaac, and of his grandsons, Esau and Jacob, and, and on down it goes to now, to this very day. And so I'm hoping to, uh, I guess, beg your indulgence that you will continue uh, listening. Uh, maybe I will get fewer letters from you. Maybe I'll hear less of people being saved, but maybe in the long term. You know, the Bible teaches us that, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to us. If, if we learn what the scriptures say, wherever we find the scriptures, if they're from God and they are, they are of use to people regardless of the age in which we find ourselves living. So, with those preambles and my apology for sidetracking from the text, again, I want to beg your indulgence uh, for having neglected you for three weeks uh, I ask you to pray for me now and in the future as I try to preach whatever I think that the Lord would have me preach to you and if it's things you already know well there's some there that may not know it and they need to uh, not necessarily to be saved but it is helpful to know the things that a preacher is talking about. To know the things that Jesus spoke about as he walked this world. And if you don't know the Old Testament, you can't know that. So, I'm going to pick up. Uh, you know, we had, we had preached a lot uh, in the preceding chapter, chapter 24, having to do with finding a wife for Isaac. The wife, as it turns out, was Rebekah. A, a relative, uh, a distant relative, but a relative of Abraham and therefore of Isaac. And I'm going to skip the last part of that other than to just say that it was important uh, to Abraham and he stressed the importance of this to his servant whom he sent to find Rebekah that Rebekah was willing to come and be Isaac's wife even though she had not met Isaac. But through, I can't know how else to describe it, but, but through the Spirit of God, bearing witness with her that this was the thing to do, just like he bore witness with Abraham, uh, that it was the right thing to do for him to leave his family and his nation and his tribe and, his, and everything, leave everything and, and go to a land that God would show him, that he would bless him there, and Isaac was the, fulfilled, the final fulfillment of that, even though there were many blessings and hardships along with that. Uh, those were instructive to us, yet in, in, in Abraham's case, God did not drag him to Canaan. He told him to go, and he left it up to, to Abraham's willingness to go or not go. Uh, and the same is true for Rebecca. Uh, if the maid is unwilling, the Lord told, uh, told I mean, uh, not the Lord, but uh, Abraham told his servant who was going to look for a bride, if she's not willing, then you're free of your, of your charge. You can come on back. But if she's willing, then bring her. And it is important, even though some teach otherwise, or they will, they will say, well, he makes us willing in the day of his power. And that's certainly true. But if it's completely against everything within us, I don't know. I, I just, I can't go along with, with those who teach 
that, uh, that we are saved uh, because God, for I don't know how else you can call it other than arbitrary reasons, reasons undisclosed, reasons that have nothing to do with the state of the creature that he finds, but that God has predestined those to be saved and predestined those to be lost from before the foundation of the world and that there's nothing they can do about it either way. If they're slated to be saved, they'll be saved. If they're slated to be lost, they'll be lost. I just don't read the scriptures that way. It, I mean, I can see why they say it, and I've read their arguments for many years, but it's, it's not convincing when compared to the, the obvious meaning of the willingness of the creature. You have to be willing to be saved. Rebecca had to be willing to marry Isaac. And she was willing, and she married him. And then I'm going to pick up in Genesis chapter 25, beginning in verse 1. And I may skip around some in this chapter for the sake of time. Remember that Sarah, Abraham's wife, now for a hundred and, I forget the time, maybe 127, well, that's her life. Anyway, for a long time, Sarah was Abraham's wife. She had died. He sends the servant to get a wife for Isaac. And comes, the servant comes home with Rebekah. And it says that Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. He lost his mother. There was no woman, no relation uh, there to help him that was female. And, and now he has a wife, Rebekah. But that still leaves Abraham a widower. And I guess he also, even in his old age, needing a wife. Who can speak against it? That the Bible speaks for it. In Genesis chapter 25, verse 1, it reads, Then again Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare Zimran, and Yokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbak, and Shua. And Jokshan begat Sheba and Dinan, or Dedan, and the sons of Dedan were Ashurim and Latushim and Leumim, and the sons of Midian, Ephah and Epher and Hanok and Abida and Eldaya. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac meaning his possessions. But unto the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac, his son, while he yet lived eastward unto the east country. And these are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived, a hundred and three score and fifteen years. And Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and he was gathered to his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, which is before Mamre, in the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth, there was Abraham buried and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed Isaac his son or blessed his son Isaac and Isaac dwelt by the well at Lahoroi. And with mistakes and pronunciation of names and other places uh, that's Genesis chapter 25, 1 through 11, as our reading lesson and text. I can't pronounce all those things. I don't know if anybody gets them right, because we don't know, we just don't know. It's a, it's a translation of a translation and, and all that. But here's what we do know. God had promised Abraham that, of, that through him, would many people be born, and that he would be the father of nations, that, that through his seed, meaning Christ, all nations, the earth would be blessed, and, and that he would have offspring innumerable, 
like the stars in the skies and, and the grains of sand on the seashore. Now some people will say, well that means we're going to have to count all the sands of, uh, sands of grain on the seashore and all the stars in the sky and, and count. God's not a bean counter. I want you to get that. It's not how people, when they start trying to say it that way, that, that there's, no, there's no poetry in the Bible or no, or no metaphoric sayings, you know, it's all exact. Well, I'm not saying it's not exact, but it's not, it means what it says in the literary style in which it's written. What it means is he will have an excessive number of physical offspring, and he'll have one offspring who is different from all the rest, unique amongst all of Adam's race, whose mother will be from Abraham genetically, but whose father is God, and that's, that's our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bless all the nations of the world with, with one particular blessing, which is life everlasting, a rescue from a state of being lost and dying in our sins that way, how he will overcome death for people, how he will rise from the dead himself and he will raise the dead later at the last day. He will, he will separate those that are, that are his through, through spiritual generation on account of what he did for them in the payment of our sins and how he will raise up a household unto God. Uh, those are one people. And there's another people that, that resist all that work and, and refuse the work of Abraham's greatest descendant, Jesus Christ. And their outcome is, is wildly different from that of those who are saved by him. But I'm getting ahead of things. I want us to understand that God fulfilled his promise to Abraham if he had had no other child but Isaac. But yet he already had Ishmael. And he's about to have a bunch more through a second wife after Sarah died. And when it speaks of concubines, there is a concubine who is Hagar. Remember, uh, Sarah gave her slave to Abraham to raise up seed to him before she ever became pregnant with Isaac, before Sarah did. And that didn't work out too good. They had to send, they had to send Ishmael away because he was, he was mocking Isaac. And the Lord agreed with Sarah that he should be sent away, he and his mother. And they were sent away. But that does not mean that Abraham and Ishmael hated each other. They were... They were half-brothers, and I believe they loved each other. And I know both of them loved their father, despite what we see as harsh treatment uh, of Hagar and Ishmael. Nevertheless, when Abraham died, we read in verse 9, that his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave that he had bought from Ephron, uh, who was the son of Zohar, a Hittite. And he had all, Abraham had already buried Sarah there, and now Abraham himself is buried there. No doubt he'd given instructions to Isaac and perhaps Ishmael of where he would be buried. And the two boys get together and they bury their father. Long before he has children, at least a year before, by his second wife. I should say third, because Hagar, he also took to wife, but he considers, for some reason he considers Hagar and Keturah, both of whom he made his wife, the Bible calls them concubines. Uh, we don't really use that term much anymore in English. So we, and, and even if we did, the meaning that we would have for it might be different from what was you know, custom then and the meaning of it then. But God made a distinction between Sarah uh, through whom Isaac was born, who eventually through whom Christ was born, and the other women uh, that, that Abraham had to wife. And, and he caused Abraham to make a distinction between 
his offspring through Hagar and through Keturah, they got one thing and Isaac got something else. According to our scripture, it says Isaac was given everything that Abraham, all that he had, he gave unto Isaac. Well, all sounds like all, doesn't it? And yet, the sons of the concubines, which Abraham had, he gave them gifts and sent them away. So it wasn't all. There were, there were gifts. For all we know, how rich Abraham was, there, they could have been extremely valuable gifts. But he reserved to Isaac his, to be his sole heir of all things, I would say, probably that mattered to Isaac. Whatsoever he would have thought Isaac wanted or needed, Isaac got. But there were leftovers, if you will, that he gave away to his children that were born him by Hagar, which would be Ishmael, and by Keturah, which are these people that I just named. And there's a bunch of them. If I'm not mistaken, I think Keturah had 12 sons and a daughter. But, you know, I'm not positive of that. But... He had a lot, and these people became the, the progenitors of tribes of people in, in the area that we currently call the Levant or, or the Middle East, and, and they covered quite a range and is a lot of folks. That, that whole part of the world ultimately were peopled by descendants of Abraham. So that the prophecy, which was very clear that he would have lots of even physical descendants and a great host of spiritual descendants was made true. And that he himself, Abraham, was comforted by a wife and, and more children, a great number of them, uh, in his old age. See how God uh, takes care of his people and of you. If you're saved, understand that there will come a day that you will be gathered to your fathers. That's how he refers to Abraham here. You know, it doesn't say that he, uh, he died and was just, uh, he just kind of ceased to exist. God speaks about Abraham, specifically Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, I mean, first off, when he meets Moses at the burning bush, much later than where we're reading here, but also when he was talking to the Pharisees, he, he spoke of these people, actually it was the Sadducees, he, was, he spoke of these Genesis uh, people by name, and he said, uh, you know, uh, he reminds the Sadducees who do not believe in the resurrection. He said, well, as concerning the resurrection, you know, life after death, he said, didn't you not read what, what he told Moses at the bush? He said, uh, I am the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. When he said am, he means presently, even though those, those fellows have been dead for a long time, yet, I mean, some 500 years or so by this time of the burning bush. And he says, God therefore is not a God of the dead, but of the living. So as Moses, as Moses explains to the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection, he uses, he gets right so granular down to the very tenses of the verbs that he uses to prove his point. When he told Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, some 500 years after they had died, he's saying, I am now their God, meaning they're not annihilated. They're not, their bodies are dead. Their bodies are in a cave called Mach Machpelah, all three of them, and they're wise. And yet they live before God. He told uh, Martha <clears throat> when her brother Lazarus had died, he said, He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. 
talking about dead in sins. They're going to be made alive through a rebirth of being born again. He says, and they that liveth, meaning have been born again, and, and trust in me, they shall never die. Now, our bodies die, but our spirit, that, that part of us which is the most important, which makes us who we are, that never ceases cognition. We always exist before God. That means that when your body dies, your spirit goes on to be with the Lord and you are comforted as Abraham was comforted when he, in a good old age, he died physically and he was gathered. It didn't mean his body was taken to where his father, his, his father was over in Haran and his grandfather was in Mesopotamia, a long way away. And yet he was gathered to his fathers. God gathered him through the angels. He took his spirit to the place of the blessed, which is the presence of God. In one place called the bosom of Abraham. And Abraham himself was taken to that paradise of God, which one day will be replaced with a new heaven and a new earth where all those who have been made righteous by God will dwell forever. So see how the Old Testament is used by Jesus to explain really important things like, you know, God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living because he is the God, even to this day, of Abraham. And he is Isaac's God and he is Jacob's God. And, and maybe he's your grandfather's God, if your grandfather was saved. And, and, and he's the God of, he, he's David, King David's God. And you see how that works? When he says is, he means he is right now. They're God. They live before him. As will you. If you ever humble your heart and repent, meaning turn to God, turn to the, to the Lord Jesus, seeking him, seeking the life that is in him, the life that you need in order to live eternally before God. You have a physical life here, but your spirit is dead to God until you're born again, and then it ever liveth to God from that time forward. Now, so the lion's share, practically everything, it speaks of all that he has, went to Isaac. What is the significance of that? Well, think about the end result of the, of the unrighteous versus the righteous. The ones where in Matthew, I think it's chapter 7, maybe it's worth turning I want you to see what's going to happen, what I think will happen in, in maybe just a very few years. Is it, is it seven? Uh, maybe. I, I may be, uh, I may have, I may be wrong about where it was. I guess I am. Anyway, Jesus, while he was here, he talked about the future. He talked about what is going to happen when, when the end of the... Oh, I don't know where it was. It's in, it's in Matthew 27. Let me turn to it because I'm, I'm sorry. This is a radio progress. But, but I'm having to turn to these things because I have not memorized this Bible. Uh, nor even really tried to. Uh, let me see if I can find it now. Never mind. It's in, it's in uh, chapter 25 of the Gospel according to Matthew. Now... If you've neglected to hear me throughout this, please pay attention now. You're going to be, you are part, you yourself are spoken of by our Lord Jesus Christ over 2,000 years ago when he said at the end of, of a, a sermon that he was giving, they called the Olivet Discourse, he talks about the end of the world because his, his disciples had asked about it. And so he gets to this point, chapter 25, verse 31. You can look at that, Matthew 25, 31. It's worth reviewing over and over again because you are there. You are one of the ones that are there. You will be. 
It says, when the Son of Man, and that's talking about Christ, shall come in his glory. That means coming back at the end of the world. And all the holy angels with him. That's, if I understand it right, that's 10,000 times 10,000. That's, that's millions, tens of millions of angels. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Now you're going to be either on the left hand or the right hand. You'll be a sheep or you will be a goat. There's not three groups or four or a million. There's two groups. Sheep and goats. Then he'll say, uh, he shall set his sheep on the left, right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, that's the sheep, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now see, that is an inheritance. Just like Isaac was given an inheritance. Well, all the, all the saved of the earth are spoken of as having been children of the promise. And the promise was the promise that was given to Abraham that through his seed, Jesus, people from all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And the blessing they get is eternal life. And at the end of the world... The blessing they get is to be the sheep and not the goats. That's an important thing because we're going to be getting very shortly to where this, this same thing happens again with, uh, with Isaac's sons. There's two of them. There's Esau. That's in this very chapter. I don't think I'm going to get it to it this time. But there's Esau and there's Jacob. And they are spoken of as, as two different types of people, God says. And, and two different nations, God says. So he divides all humanity the same way. Two different types of people would be the descendants, the spiritual descendants, if you will, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through that line. And the spiritual descendants of all the other people that are not of that lineage, that are not uh, have been that, that are not the children of promise, meaning those who have been born again by the workings of our Lord Jesus Christ, who came according to promise as the great descendant of Abraham. You can either be in that nation and be that type of person. Or you're going to be on the left hand of God, which he describes as the goats. And he talks about what happens to the goats in Matthew 25 and verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So there's a place of everlasting fire that God made for the devil and his angels. But we read of that place as having enlarged itself and opened wide its mouth to accept additional comers. And those additional comers are not angels, but they are, they are the, the children of, a, of a, well, the children of Adam, the human race that has not been born again based on the actions of our Lord Jesus Christ and their own willingness, just as Rebecca was, full willingness to come to Christ in order to be born again. See, it is. It's, it's fundamental stuff that we'll need to know so that we can understand the things that are, that are preached to us so that we don't have to restate all this every time we preach. Now, I'm bad about restating things. I'm sorry about that, but that's just the way I'm wired. I do want to make it clear, and I think by making it clear sometimes, 
it becomes so long and tedious that I wouldn't blame you if you switched the radio off rather than listening to me. I would have. Up until I was saved, I would have turned me off in a heartbeat. I wouldn't have listened to me preach for, for 30 seconds because I had no thought about God or about salvation. In fact, I had become an atheist, utterly rejecting all things concerning God. Nevertheless, the Lord, at a particular point, it was brought about by the witness of someone, began to draw me to himself. And as he drew, I drew. And as I drew, he drew. We, we came together mutually looking for the same thing. He wanted to save me, and I wanted to be saved by him. I was willing, but I was weak. And it wasn't until he made me, in my own heart, completely weak, utterly powerless, and, and caused me to know it. So that, so that when I got saved, there was no doubt who gets all the credit for that. It was not myself. I utterly denied my own self. I didn't have the wisdom to do that, but, but Christ working on my heart through the Spirit gave me the wisdom that I needed to abandon all things in this world, to, to hate my own life in this world so that I might have the forgiveness of God and life eternal. This is brought out in what happens next uh, in this chapter, and I'm going to skip over reading about all the descendants that Abraham had through Keturah. They matter some because their names pop up in the biblical narrative of the Old Testament. But, uh, you know, particularly the descendants of Ishmael, who are with us to this day. They are the Arab people, regardless of what religion they are. Not all Arabs are Muslim. I'd say most are. But they are the type of people that we learn about towards the end of this chapter, starting in verse 24. So, uh, uh, actually, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pick it up, Lord willing, next week at Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. And, uh, and we will read about two types of people, two nations of the earth. And, and they represent, and actually some of them become, you know, the sheep and the goats spoken of by our Lord in Matthew, where he shows what's going to happen to everybody when he comes back. And in whatever state you're in, whether you are a sheep or a goat, you will remain in that state when he comes back. There, it will be too late uh, to change your mind. It'll be too late to repent. You will repent, but you'll find no place of repentance. He won't allow the repentance. If you wait until you either die in your sins or until he comes back, which could very, very well be in our lifetime, in the lifetime of this generation, and I'm old, and yet I still think it could happen before I die. I'm not looking for it to happen because whether I die or not is irrelevant to me. The same thing will happen to me. The Lord's going to raise my body. If I'm not raised from the grave, he will, he will change my body when he comes back into a spiritual body, an everlasting body, a sinless body. But... Uh, Whatever state you're in when he comes back, he speaks of us. He says, let he, this is like that's going to be proclaimed from, I don't know if it's one of the angels or from the Lord himself. He says, uh, I, I think it says, but I just can't remember which. It says, let he that is righteous be righteous still. Let he that is wicked or ungodly. Or no, it's, it's filthy. I think is the term. Let he that is filthy be filthy still. So he comes back and you're going to want to be righteous 
but you will remain filthy. And there are some of us who have been made righteous, and certainly we won't want to become filthy, but it means that he has kept us righteous from the time he saved us until the time he comes back. So one state or the other. And when you truly begin to understand the Bible, you'll see that this is the way that it's, this is really what it's all about. The whole thing, you know, Christ speaking to Pharisees talked about how he and the father worked together. The father, the son would do nothing except what the father showed him, but the father showed him everything. And they, they had worked continuously, I think, since Adam sinned up until now. They're working salvation in the midst of the earth. They are saving those who are willing to be saved. And then he says, so he's given Christ the ability to quicken or give life to whomever he will. But he also gave him judgment so he can judge the guilty and punish them. It all boils down to either you get life, true life, meaning uh, meaning spiritual life which you don't have by nature but is given to us when we're born again either you have that or you're judged and condemned by the Lord Jesus when he returns don't we want to learn about that don't we want to I could hear some of you because I, I was one of you. I, I, I would just like you. I would, if, if I'd listened this long, I'd probably be thinking about shooting myself or being an idiot. But if I listened this long, I, w- I would hear that question. I'd say, nope, I don't want to hear about that. I couldn't care less about that. That's all a big fiction, I would say. This guy is an idiot, I would say. And I'm not going to argue now. I'm not saying that I'm smart. But I am saying that what I'm talking about is real and that it matters. In fact, we think everything matters except that which really does. And that which really does, we don't think it matters. What really matters is whether or not you get saved, whether or not God forgives you and gives you in this world eternal life so that when he list those who have life and who he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and he goes right on the line down all the way to now and your name is there in a book it's called the book of life the Lamb's book of life those to whom the Lamb Jesus has given life if your name is there you're good to go on that day if your name is not there, he says the books are opened. Books, multiple. Not the book of life, but many books. He says that the dead, those who have not been made alive by Christ, will be judged out of the things written in the book, whether they be good or evil. Well, I can just tell you that the result of that is that if you're in those books, it'll be counted evil. And you'll be judged and condemned you're already condemned, the Bible teaches us, and, and you go to the bad place. It is important that you learn these things. God bless you, and I appreciate your patience, and I beg your forgiveness for, for not preaching for you these past three weeks. Bye-bye.